Hello, everyone. I'm Becca, dietitian by trade, mom 24-7, wife from the start, and when there's a few extra hours in the day, you might find me hitting the trails or on horseback. And I'm Kara, a therapist to women, a mom to a boy, an entrepreneur, mountain junkie, and a postpartum runner. And this is Fit for a Queen, a podcast that's devoted to the female athlete wanting to balance the teeter-totter of all the things we desire out of life as women. Performance, health, intellect, and taking time for self, even if we only get one minute out of the day. We're so excited to be bringing you the queens in the athletic world who have done just that. Okay, ladies, take a seat at your thrones, grab your crowns, and welcome to Fit for a Queen. Welcome back to Fit for a Queen. We're happy to have Jill Paleo on. Jill is a former collegiate soccer player, triathlete, marathoner, and ultra runner who went through almost five years of amenorrhea before finally addressing her issues to get healthy. Shocked at just how much she didn't know about hormones and menstrual health for athletes, she decided to share her research and wisdom on both hypothalamic the Lamech amenorrhea <laughs> and overtraining syndrome through her YouTube channel. Her passion for counseling others even led her to go back to school at Harvard University's Extension School, where she is pursuing a master's degree in psychology in order to fully support athletes in their path to health. Welcome, Jill. Hi, ladies. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Jill. And uh, I follow you on Instagram, obviously, but it's, it looked like you recently got through uh, a big test. Yes, I did. Um, school is definitely taking up quite a bit of time, which is great, but um, I love it, so I don't mind. It was a huge exam, but I did well, so it was it was worth it. Good, good. Well, hopefully now you can do some relaxing, and now you're on a podcast, so. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm celebrating with you. <laughs> um, Jill, you went through quite a process in terms of being diagnosed with Amenoria, can you tell us a little bit about this journey that led to this struggle and then, um, again, your journey in trying to get diagnosed? Yeah, sure. Um, so I lost my period. I can tell you now, and a lot of this, of course, is in hindsight. I lost my period once I bumped up my weekly running mileage to train for my first ultramarathon. And I followed a pretty standard training protocol increases of about 10% per week and included my step back weeks. But as soon as I got over a certain weekly mileage, I lost my period. And I kind of ignored it, being honest. <laughs> just never really occurred to me that it was something out of the ordinary, especially for someone who was training for an ultra marathon. It seems like that was just how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, so I just kept going with that. Uh, and eventually I got to a point where you know, it dawned on me, gee, it's been a few years now. I really need to look into this. So I did what a lot of us do, which is go to our first, our sort of first thought is, let me go to a gynecologist and see what they have to say. And so I did. I went to a gynecologist and um, she turned around and looked at me and said, uh, you're a skinny runner. What do you expect, basically? And um, you know, I was super angry. I was super hurt. She doesn't know me. How could she say these things? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... Um, you know, I just felt really, uh, I felt that it was just such a harsh answer. She also was a little brusque with me being completely honest. And I think she, she had sort of half a point in the sense that um, it was easy to look at someone like me and consider how much uh, sport training I was doing and think, oh, well, you know, this is what she gets, of course. She didn't know the intimate details of my life, but... I really, uh, I understand where she's coming from now. I have, I have empathy for, <laughs> for what she said to me. Um, and uh, I, I went on from that being upset and still didn't do anything about it for quite some time um, until I really hit a point where the, actually it was the overtraining syndrome symptoms that really started to encroach on what I consider to be a healthy um, a, a sense of well-being. And that's when I really started to try to understand what was going on, not realizing that um, the amenorrhea was just part and parcel of the overtraining syndrome um, that I was headed toward at that time. Mm -hmm. um, being honest, in terms of diagnosis, I don't think I ever had a physician or any healthcare practitioner come out and say to me specifically uh, the words that I thought I needed to hear, you have X, Y, Z. And... I, I, it was sort of a diagnosis of exclusion, and that's typically what it is. Yeah. 
And what it taught me was that getting getting caught up in the name, getting caught up in the actual diagnosis is not really that wise. If you don't have a period, there's a problem. And it doesn't really matter what you call it. You can call it anything you want, but um, it's something that needs to be addressed. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how I figured things out. I like that. If you don't have a period, there's something going on. Right. <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. That. I do have a lot of, yeah, I have a lot of women that write to me and say, gee, I, you know, I haven't been diagnosed with this. I'm not sure that's what it is. And I say, do you get a period at all? No. Okay, then you have a problem. Right. It doesn't matter. You know, it could be uh, hypothalamic amenorrhea. It could be banana split amenorrhea. It doesn't really matter what it is. <laughs> you don't have a period. You got to you gotta handle it. Yeah. And hence why I think we're seeing a lot of that being pushed as a vital sign. So it's being addressed at every visit with as many healthcare individuals as possible. So you mentioned overtraining syndrome. I've seen it more investigated in the European countries where we're lacking in a lot of information. Can you explain what that is and what were some of the symptoms that you experienced? Absolutely. Um, One of the things I do want to make clear is that when I'm talking about overtraining syndrome, I'm actually talking about the syndrome um, that we know as the step that comes after what is called overreaching, and I'll explain that. I'm not talking about training too much or what is colloquially called overtraining. You know, gee, I'm, I'm training too much. Um, I'm talking about something that actually happens over time when the uh, body becomes taxed in a way that it cannot recover from. So overtraining syndrome is basically a constellation of symptoms that um, – comes after uh, inadequate recovery, repeat, repeated bouts of inadequate recovery. So typical training requires stress of the system, stress of the body, followed by adequate recovery. And adaptations are made to, the, to body systems that will improve fitness. When you push too hard without getting that adequate recovery, you end up with a body that cannot keep up with that repair, and then you have systems that suffer. And I... Always, the best way I can describe this is I say if you feel if you feel poorly and you think, gosh, I might be training too much, that's probably overreaching, which is the step before overtraining. And if you think you might be dying, you might have overtraining too. <laughs> it does not. It doesn't Simple feel step. like exhaustion. It, yeah, it feels like a disease. It feels like something is wrong. I've had people say to me that they thought they had cancer. They thought they had Addison's disease. They went to a doctor and said, you have to fix me. I'm dying. Um, and it's not an exaggeration. It, it really feels like something is very, very wrong. Um, my personal symptoms were night sweat, insomnia. I had massive blood sugar problems, uh, reactive hypoglycemia. I had mood issues. I mean, as you can imagine, I had, of course, amenorrhea was, is, is part of that because that being the reproductive system um, disruption. I had extremely painful legs. I mean, like I always say, it was like someone was banging hammers into my quads. Mm. Uh, I had a lot of fatigue. I was so sad all the time. Of course, as a result of, you know, it's chicken or egg, you know, as a result of and also um, uh, preceding all of these symptoms. And it was pretty, it was pretty dramatic. I really, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I really felt horrible. I'm glad you reached out and got help. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, what was yeah. kind of the final straw? Where like I am, I am done. This isn't. This isn't right. <laughs> this is this is kind of a funny story. Um, and my very good friend Sherry Yannick, who is also an ultra runner, she is the uh, race director for the uh, Burning Man 50K, mm-hmm. which uh, a lot of people are familiar with. Yeah. She and I were about to do the Dick Collins Fire Trail 50-miler in California. I was living out in the Bay Area at the time. And on the morning of the race, uh, there was construction on the road that was preventing us from getting where we needed to go, potentially preventing us from getting where we needed to go on time. And I had the world's worst rip-roaring panic attack (laughs) Mm -hmm. right there in the car on the way to the race. And it was just overwhelming the it was very clear to me uh, that things were not not good, yeah. and all of the physical and yeah, all the physical and mental stuff just kind of hit ahead. And I, I love Sherry; like she dealt with me so well. Uh, I mean, I'm sure in, <laughs> she was going like, "What is going on with this girl?" But <laughs> it was really just that was, yeah, 
what a good friend, right? But yeah. um, that was just the end of the road. That was mm-hmm. just, that was it. It's also if you're having a panic attack around your races, yeah. <laughs> there's also something yeah. going on. Might have been some wisdom. Yeah, that tiny bit of a red happen. flag. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, what did recovery look like for you? Can you speak about um, what you went ahead and did to um, get to a place of um, healthier relationship or a healthier um, way around training? Yeah. So. Recovery from overtraining syndrome and recovery from amenorrhea are sort of different in the sense that if you want to get your period back, there's uh, very sort of simple and hard things that you can do, which are things like decrease the amount of exercise that you're doing and increase um, caloric intake, you know, in- increase your energy uh, intake and all that stuff. That, that's sort of like technical. Um, recover from overtraining syndrome is something that... Um, takes a very long time and you can of course do things like you're not going to want to be doing anything that's going to resemble training during that time it's Mm -hmm. a lot of walking it's a lot of yoga yeah it's a lot of foam rolling it's a lot of stretching and you know amenorrhea ends when you get your period back which is great because it's like ta-da and you can (laughs) clearly see a visual (laughs) yes that you've done well and just keep doing what you're doing and everything's going to be fine. But recovery from overtraining syndrome is really hard because you don't get that beautiful uh, vindication of, wow, I I did this right. Look at me. I'm back. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, it's a long road. And uh, when I thought I was back, I went ahead and trained up for another 50K and did that. And then that was not smart. Kind of headed back into symptom land after that. And um, it has been a struggle to figure out what my body can and can't do since I burned it out massively. And um, in the interim, or I should say in in the tail end of this recovery process, I discovered that I have a labral tear and in my uh, hip and yeah, and some other uh, sort of nasty stuff going on in my hip that have prevented me from really trying to push too hard to quote unquote come back. And I'm going to be a hundred percent honest with you and tell you that my goals are not the same anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I really have changed my relationship to sport. I have changed my relationship to exercise. I have changed um, my relationship most importantly. And, and this is really what I work on now uh, with other people. I have changed my relationship with myself Mm -hmm. so much that yeah that it's the the goals I once had if I really sit down and investigate them I understand that they weren't always there for the best reasons and so because I have a better relationship with myself now exercise is a different thing for me and training is a different thing for me yeah Yeah. I love your you're doing a lot of videos on a series of like around the athletic identity and how would you say that has changed as your relationship to sport has changed. Yeah, this is where I do most of my research right now um, for school and also um, for, I I work for a company that actually is uh, developing an app that um, is is trying to help uh, underline, uh, let's say, risk factors for things like burnout and overtraining syndrome. So I work on this stuff a lot. Um, I can tell you now that I know that part of the reason why I needed to be uh, identified, let's just go back and say athletic identity is something that typically, you know, traditionally would be like collegiate athletes and professional athletes and elite athletes would, would struggle with this when they inevitably have to sort of like take a left turn away from their sport. Um, And we see this, we see this a lot with with that population, but because nowadays we have uh, what I like to call um, sort of like high, uh, high intensity or, or, uh, people who who actually participate in sport at such a high level now that they that they sort of end up mimicking those elite or professional athletes with regard to their allegiance to their sport or their need to be sort of aligned with their sport. Mm-hmm. And so um, I know that uh, I struggled a lot at the beginning because um, being being honest again, it was kind of an insecurity thing. Uh, I needed to be seen as an athlete. I needed to identify with the lifestyle, the ultra runner kind of thing. Um, I needed to be able to say something about myself to the world. And I did that through the sport. 
I loved the fact that it was considered crazy. I loved the fact that everyone was like, oh, my God, how do you do it? I mm-hmm. can't walk 30 miles or I can't drive my car 30 miles. How do you run 30 miles? You know, this kind of stuff. Or 60 mm-hmm. miles or 100 miles, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I think that our culture encourages that kind of, uh, you know, uh, wanting to be identified as an athlete. We even objectify athletes in some regards. We want to be like them. We want to embody their characteristics of discipline. And we think that's like the greatest thing. And wow, you know, you always do is like scroll through Instagram for five seconds and you just see that like everything is just uh, supporting this, this kind of stuff, you know, keep going, drill harder, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I definitely think I needed that at one point in my life. I needed to be aligned with that. I needed to feel like that represented me. Um, uh, now, you know, I, I very much have moved away from that because I've learned to cultivate the things about myself and really do some, some, some work and look inside and, and, and pay attention to the things about myself that have nothing to do with sport that are, that are pretty great. Mm -hmm. And, that's what I encourage people that work with me to do is to now um, you know, understand why you needed to have such, such uh, identification with that sport. And, and then I realized that that sport is a wonderful thing about you, but it is not you. And mm-hmm. there's so much more to you. You know, we, we talk a lot about perfectionism with performance, but it's almost like we're now looking at perfectionism within athletic endeavors a colleague and I were talking about like, you know, a few years ago, it was a big deal to see 26.2 sticker on the back of a car. Well, now it's everywhere. And now it's 50 Ks, 100 Ks. And it's like, where's it going to stop? Mm-hmm. So um, we want to right. hear we want to hear more about your YouTube videos and blog, um, why you decided to use that platform to share your story and knowledge. Yes, uh, I again, I, you know, my whole my whole vibe is all about honesty. And um, again, being honest, I started my Instagram account again out of that insecurity because I was going through this process. I knew I was gonna try to gain some weight. Um, you know, just going back for one second, I have celiac disease, and when I got diagnosed with celiac disease uh, a long time ago, I just like cut things out, but didn't really add things back in. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, you know, a different time back then. Things were things were not available as they are now. And I didn't do my due diligence when I amped up my athletic training to sort of cover the bases nutritionally. And that definitely contributed to um, uh, my underfueling for sure. And I was afraid of certain foods because of celiac and all the other food allergies I had. So going in and researching and kind of like now adding all these foods to my diet was scary. And I knew I was going to be gaining weight and doing less exercise. And I was still very much in the ultra world. And I was afraid of what people were going to say about me. So I started the Instagram account because I thought that I uh, could sort of be the one in control of the conversation. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then if I like kind of came out with my plan and what I was doing and I was the first one to say it, that like I would sort of like head that off at the past, so to speak. Um, I thought it would be less scary. I, I realized that some of the things that uh, I realized is that I, I was not afraid to talk about what I was going through, but what I was afraid of was people judging me before I came out with it. I know that sounds ridiculous now, but um, those were the things I was concerned with. And, you know, I think that fear of other people's judgment is on a lot of people's minds when they head down this road. Um, so that's how I started the Instagram account. But then people started reaching out and I would share some of the research I was doing and it just really, really snowballed from there. And then I was like struggling with writing these like, you know, huge long Instagram posts and <laughs> uh, decided to take it to YouTube. Um, I don't know why I, I thought that would be a good way. I think actually I thought it was like a time saver. I was like, yeah, I'll just, I'll just talk. It'll be great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I was not realizing all the like, you know, editing and craziness that goes along with it, but it's been fun. And then of course the, the website started out as a place just for me to hold the YouTube videos. And then that expanded into the blog. And um, uh, then I, you know, got the health coach certification and started talking to clients on the phone and, yeah went back to school to get the master's degree and it's really just been this huge 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 just like massive snowball that I'm super excited about but really just started out just because I was afraid (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, we're glad that you put that out there for everybody to follow. Your YouTube videos are nice. Mm -hmm. They're great. No, <laughs> that's great Thank information. You. Yeah, you do a great job. And again, um, appreciate your vulnerability and honesty. So, Jill, at the end of every interview, we like to um, ask our interviewees how they live out the FIT philosophy in terms of balancing performance, health, intellect, and time for self. So how do you, Jill, find all the balance out there with um, a lot of the things that you're working on? That is a great question. Um, the way that I find balance and this is something I never used to do, is to really listen to the little voice inside that tells me to think of myself first and to always act with self-care first. Um, it's kind of a buzzword these days of, you know, practicing self-care and all this mm -hmm. stuff. But um, I find that when I put other things in front of what is really right for me, I always end up doing things for the wrong reasons. So, I really try very hard to not overextend myself in ways that I was happy to do before. And again, I know that's very individual, but for me, it, it really works. I try my best to accommodate everything I can, mm -hmm. you know, juggle all the balls. But when it comes down to it, if I'm not listening to myself inside, it's just not worth it. That little voice knows so much. It sure <laughs> does. <laughs> Well, Jill, thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate, again, kind of your honesty and um, sharing your story with everyone. You're a great resource to so many. And um, check out and connect with Jill at acaseofthejills.com. Thanks so much, Jill, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Yeah, Wait, have a good Jill, one. one more thing. Are oh, you teaming thanks. up with Strong Runner Chicks at the retreat? I, I am not able to go out oh, there this year. No, okay. I, yeah, I live in Italy and, um, you know, it's a little bit difficult. It was difficult for me to get back to the States this summer. So I would have loved to be there with them. I do know that, um, uh, Rachel Old Road style is going to be there yeah. from, uh, mm -hmm. running in silence. Mm -hmm. She's going to be there. I know there's going to be a huge group of awesome ladies out there and I know they're going to have fun. I really wish I was going, but, um, well, yeah, if anyone's going, have like a great to be time. In Italy too, so. <laughs> Yeah, you, you do well, one you there and Karen and I will come. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Jill. Take care. Have a great Thank day, you, Jill. ladies. Mm -hmm. Take care. Bye bye. Bye, bye Queens. Thank you to our sponsor today, Sentimano Counseling. Sentimano Counseling is the premier perinatal mental health practice in Kansas City, treating mood disorders during pregnancy and postpartum, perinatal loss, infertility, eating, and exercise disorders. Go to sentimano.com for further information about the practice and services. For additional information on today's topic and guests, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at fit for a queen and Hashtag don't, fit for a queen. And don't forget to rate us on iTunes. We can't wait for you to join us next time on Fit for a Queen. Bye, queens.